Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it is a distinct pleasure to be in Maine, um, the home state of one of my heroes, next to George Washington, probably uh, my greatest hero, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who I take my grandchildren to Gettysburg and show them where he was and tell them about what he did, uh, especially as he led the 20th Maine in the bayonet charge against the 15th Alabama and essentially swung the flanks and consolidated what would be probably the greatest Union victory in what was the greatest struggle we've ever been involved in. You think about the population at the time, you think about 600,000 dead. Compare that with World War II where it was about 300,000. And you understand the profound nature of that conflict. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. I'm grateful for this beautiful weather, as I'm sure you are. And mostly, I'm grateful, although the lights are in my eyes so brightly I can't see you anymore, but I could when I was over there. Uh, how many people are here, young and old, to participate in this? It's been said earlier, but I want to say it again, that this is, along with the young people in my seminars for the last seven years, what gives me the greatest confidence in this great country is people like you who are interested in what's happening and who are asking questions like, how do I make a difference? Now, I was going to talk to you today about much of what Amory has talked to you about, only in much more layman terms than he. And I was going to talk to you a bit about what Clyde talked to you about, only in much more layman terms than he, because I believe General Eisenhower President Eisenhower was absolutely right when he said national security is not about soldiers, Marines, airmen, aircraft carriers, tanks, bombers, fighters, and so forth. It's not about the paraphernalia of war. It's about the ultimate feeling of the American people for their democratic federal republic. It's about their future. It's about their grandchildren's future. It's about how all of that composite family feels and ultimately that rests on the strength of our economy. Five-star general, the man who led Operation Overlord, knew, knew what makes America strong, robust, and ultimately great. He also said, I will not spend a penny more on defense than is necessary. With some frustration in that press conference. He also said in 1961, as he was departing, beware of the military industrial complex. He wanted to say military industrial congressional complex. <laughs> some wise aide struck that out for him. Uh, not too good for a departing president, eight years, you know, Let's just have a last blow at the Congress. But he was right, and he's even righter today. In fact, Senator John McCain is on film saying, in response to a question about was Ike right, Ike was not only right, what's happening today is horrible. This is John McCain, my party. Due diligence, I'm a Republican. <laughs> well, how did we get here? How did, we, how did we build what is in essence, if you take Michael Hogan's phrase in his wonderful book, A Cross of Iron, president of Connecticut, University of Connecticut now, how did we get to the national security state that we've become? All you have to do, if you're like me, is walk around the complex that has burgeoned and read Dana Priest's piece about this, 840,000 top secret clearances now, inside the Beltway. It is incredible. The D Director of National Te Intelligence alone has put up about $6 billion worth of new buildings and new assets. And all of this, because an operation conducted, tragic as it was, on September the 11th, 2001, cost bin Laden about $500,000. All of this has precipitated us to spend somewhere between two and three trillion and to still be at war, and we've been at war for a decade plus. How did we get here? How did we get to this point? I'm picking up on Clyde's point this morning about the war state. 
because that's, in many respects, what we are. How did we get here? Let me tell you a story. Last week and the week before, I became the Quaker colonel. <laughs> the, the, friends, the Friends Committee on National Legislation in Washington. Some of you probably heard of, it, heard of it. They asked me to come in, and they'd heard what I'd been saying about war with Iran, the potential for war with Iran, and they asked me to come in, and so we went over and we saw senators and congressmen, and more importantly, we saw their key staff, both committee and professional staff. We saw Cantwell, we saw Boxer, we saw Guthrie, one of my Republicans from Kentucky in the House. And the ostensible reason we were there was to talk about a very simple thing, an ink sea agreement, an incidence at sea agreement with the Iranians. The military wants it. All it does is the same thing we did with the Soviets for years. It gives us some standard operating procedures and importantly, some communications channels in order to prevent an incident between the very close proximity forces in the Gulf right now, especially those in the IRGC Navy, because the Iranian professional Navy is just that, it's pretty professional. The IRGC though, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, you never know what they're gonna do. And when they do it, you don't know if the orders come from Tehran or not. So this is a very dangerous situation, could precipitate a Tonkin Gulf incident at any moment, the professionalism of the United States Navy and associated forces is what's prevented it to this point, I think. But we need one. And I had a second reason. I wanted to establish at least some, even if it were tactical, some kind of face-to-face -face communication, communications between the Persians and us. Communications, incidentally, like we had in 2001 and early 2002 in Afghanistan. Communications that at that time were very professional and very successful in dealing with things like border control, in dealing with things like Al-Qaeda, ultimately in dealing even with the Bonn Conference. And then came the State of the Union Address, identifying Iran as a member of the Axis of Evil, and everything stopped. So I wanted at least that kind of communication. Let me tell you what I found. Banking staff, Tim Johnson's Senate Banking Committee, and the banking staff underneath that was working on the banking's legislation. Um, working with foreign affairs in the House and then working with uh, Senate Foreign Relations staff and a couple of members in the Senate. What I found is everyone telling me, Colonel, the space is closing down. The space to maneuver, the space is closing down. With Israel attached to that space, at any moment the herd mentality will take over and those of us who want to maintain some sobriety and some sanity will be overwhelmed. I said, are you telling me we're going to war with Iran? I'm telling you that the situation is really dicey. Well, I said back to them, you know what our diplomacy looks like to me? Unless there's some secret talks going on. I gave them that. I said, unless there's some secret talks going on that I don't know about, and God, I pray there are. But unless there are, our diplomacy is sanctions. That's our diplomacy. And I can tell you from my students having presented case study after case study to me for seven years on the overthrow of Mossadegh in 53 by the Eisenhower administration, of the fall of the Shah in 79 with Carter and Brzezinski working that one, and with everything that's transpired in between, the Persians, the Iranians will never accept that kind of sanction. Now, if we're working in private, if we're working in secret, as I said, we may have some breakthroughs, and that would be wonderful. But what I'm telling you is the legislative branch is giving the president all the paint he needs and handing them the brush too to put him in a corner. Let me tell you about one particular amendment that the banking staff thought they were exquisitely successful in preventing, and I agree. But there's more to the story. First, what they stopped. Ileana ross Leitman, chairwoman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, she who from her position in the Congress has called for the assassination of Fidel Castro. She wanted to amend their legislation so that it would actually prevent any American citizen whatsoever in uniform or out from talking with any Iranian because it would be material support to terrorism and they would be prosecuted thusly. And the banking staff was very happy that they'd beaten that back. And yet what they handed me 
as the legislation that they were going to try to pass to the House and get a consent and not have any more amendments to and pass was not diplomacy. How did we get to this point? There are a number of reasons. And believe me, as an academic and as a colonel and junior officer and enlisted man, I've seen these real re reasons building since about 1965. As an academic, I've seen them building since 1947. And the National Security Act, which on July the 26th, Truman signed in what was the precursor to Air Force One and George Marshall, then the iconic military figure in America, and certainly another hero of mine, said to the president, I fear we've militarized the decision-making process. And George Marshall was right. Let's just examine the top of the heap. How does the president make these fateful decisions? That's what I tell my students they are. A fateful decision is, designed, is defined as a presidential decision that sends young men and young women, because they aren't old, they're young. Socrates said old men send young men to war, and increasingly young women. And we count that a positive achievement, by the way. We make these decisions to send young men and young women in harm's way, to die for state purposes, and we forget this, to kill others for state purposes. All the terrorist attacks in the history of the United States, both colonial and national, have killed about 5,000 Americans. We have killed already 300,000 in retribution. We have also spent, as I said, somewhere between two and three trillion dollars. That's not a very good cost-effectiveness analysis, despite the tragedy of losing Americans. My former boss said it this way, we need to be resilient in this country. We need to be able to absorb an attack like that, knock some buildings down, kick some people, pick up, get back on our feet, and go right on ahead and not spend two or three trillion dollars and kill 300,000 people in the process of getting even. So the president makes these fateful decisions, and we study them on both sides of the coin. Clandestine, like the overthrow of Mossadegh in 53 by Kermit Roosevelt and the CIA, and overt, like Harry Truman's decision to oppose the North Korean invasion of the South in 1950. And we go all the way up and stop about March 2003 when George W. Bush, my president, the president that I serve, decides to go into Iraq. And there are a number of things that my students pull out immediately. The first thing they normally pull out is that the 1% in this country that we're always talking about, the billionaires, the people who have established the most profound maldistribution of wealth in this country since 1929, and I don't use that year for, you know, 1929 was a bad year. <laughs> and then we forget about the other 1%, that 1% that does go in harm's way for us, because that's what it is, ladies and gentlemen, it's less than 1%. There's no draft. There's no judges or congressmen or doctors or lawyers, son or daughter, so to speak. Not many anyway. No Harvard graduates, not many anyway. I did meet one in the Marine Corps one time. <laughs> Who are over there in Iraq or Afghanistan. Go watch that Jim Lehrer News Hour. The thing after the news comes when they show the pictures and everything. And I always point to my wife and I say, look, you've never heard of any of those towns. Or they're big cities like Los Angeles or New York. These are people, I'm not denigrating their patriotism, their courage, or their service. I'm telling you they're the lowest of the 1% in terms of power because at the top is that 1% with the wealth and they are ultimate power and at the bottom is ultimate absence of power. And I have every, every pride in my heart for these men and women who go and do it anyway. And yet, this makes our president, commander in chief, a lot easier. There is no conscription. There is no penalty. These men and women signed up, as one New York lawyer told me recently, and they get whatever they deserve. We pay them well, he said. It's all I could do to keep from smacking him. <laughs> There's a second reason. The second reason that my students come up with generally, they call not just the military industrial complex, Lockheed Martin and the F-22, for example, trying to fight Secretary Robert Gates to the pits on ter in terms of the F-22. 
I mean, that was a battle royal inside the Beltway between a massive defense contractor and the Secretary of Defense. You are not going to stop our airplane. Oh, yes, I am. And, of course, they came together in some kind of compromise. I think if Secretary Gates had really gotten his way, he probably would have done away with the thing altogether. But it has another nefarious component, and my students, because many of them are Afghan and Iraq veterans, that's partly the reason, come up with this reason. And the reason is that the president now can get around in strength limitations established by your Congress under Article I of the Constitution by hiring private contractors. You don't want to send, you can't send because you don't have them 500,000 troops to Iraq, but you can send 300,000 or 200,000 because you can augment them with 100,000 contractors. So we let these contractors essentially privatize the ultimate public function, war. And they're everywhere now. They cook, they wash clothes, they do whatever's necessary to free up the combat elements to do just that combat. And here's a footnote. If we really do have to fight a big war sometime in the future, our forces won't be able to do it because the contractors will not go to that war you will not be able to pay them enough. So that's another reason. The privatization of the ultimate public function, the military industrial congressional complex with the addition of contractors. And then my students come up with this one. Well, you know, our system is so paralyzed and a president can't get anything done, so he turns to the one efficient, effective instrument in his arsenal and he uses it. Read Alexander Hamilton's Federalist 41. Read James Madison's Letters of Helvidius. Read Hamilton's Federalist 8. And you will see that Hamilton, often accused of being the ultimate monarchist in our midst, Hamilton says, the surest way to tyranny, and it doesn't matter whether it's a democracy or a monarchy, is to give the executive the war power. And that brings me to the last point that my students elicit, the Congress has indeed abandoned that war power to the executive. They started it majorly with Harry Truman in the Korean War, but at least there was some consultation. They ended it with no consultation whatsoever when the president went into Libya without even talking to the Congress and said in defense until he realized how ridiculous it was, Oh, dropping bombs is not conflict. Right. Don't tell that to an instrument who's been under those bombs. I got invited over to the Hill, seven Republicans, one Democrat. And I said, you guys, I looked at the Democrat and I said, well, no, can't be that. But then I went ahead because the bulk of them were Republicans. You guys have got me over here because you want to launch some kind of political objection to the president and everything else. No, they said, we want to talk to you about the war power. We want to talk to you about the war power. I said, what about the war power? You guys abdicated long ago. Oh, no, we haven't. No, we haven't. We passed this war powers resolution. It's public law. The president has to do this. President. I said, what you did was you told the president, hey, we recognize that you've accrued this power. All we want to do is make you report on it. That's what you did. You abdicated. And they started arguing with me. And we argued for 15 or 20 minutes. And finally, I said, look, I've served three presidents fairly intimately. George H.W. Bush, William Jefferson Clinton, and George W. Bush till I was sick of it. And I can tell you what the president thinks about the war power. You do not have it. <laughs> you know, this was a real epiphany for them. So where does this leave us? It leaves us with a chief executive who, if we believe Madison, if we believe Hamilton, if we believe, go back and read any of that debate, even the Anti-Federalists, if we believe any of this history of power and the abuse thereof, we're left with a military industrial complex that Dwight Eisenhower warned us about, and I wish I could remember exactly what he said. It's beautiful, I'll paraphrase, I'll get it really close, only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can save us from this mixture of national security and democratic values so that liberty and security together survive. And yet, think about it. 
Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, and that was the shibboleth of the revolution. Today, it's give me security at any cost, including my liberties. And I'm down there in the Beltway, and I watch it happen every single day. I sit on the Constitution Project's Liberty and Security Committee, and on my right is the Vice President of the NRA, and on my left is General Counsel for the ACLU. I mean, it's and I'm in the middle. <laughs> I, I, I say I occupy the radical center. And yet, we are all concerned about the same thing. The constant, never-ceasing usurpation of your liberties by the NSA, by the government in general, you name it. We're looking at things like laptops coming across the border. Are they really property? Can't they be confiscated? Can't they be downloaded? If they find anything on them that's criminal, can't they prosecute you without any kind of warning, without any kind of reasonable suspicion or probable cause? These are arcane issues, but they're happening every single day. And the biggest one, the biggest one is the war power. How do we get this back? Because we are, and the soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines, God bless them, the officer corps in particular is probably one of the most educated group of people in this country. The Army sent me to school for six years in the civilian world and put me in its own schools for four years. And frankly, I got the best education I've ever gotten in my life at the United States Naval War College at Newport, Rhode Island. My civilian equivalents in the Defense Department, for example, or at the State Department, were scared to go away to civilian school because if they got into it, they'd be out of the mainstream and lose promotion and selection. Incredible. Your officer corps, and you should thank this situation in terms of civil-military relations, is incredibly intelligent. You're going to see two people that will exhibit that, I'm sure, here this afternoon, but there are many more. And that's what's really saved a lot of this from being worse than what I'm describing to you. But they can't hold out forever. One of the things that Mark and Wayne are probably going to talk to you about is how the leading bureaucracy in your government, dealing with oceans, dealing with energy, dealing with climate change, is the DOD. They don't run around asking themselves if it disagrees with their religion. <laughs> they, they know the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. They don't care, but they do care about powering their airplanes, their ships, their submarines, and other things. And they do care about the latest technological innovations, and they care about things like this. As one admiral said to me at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, at one of our meetings up there on oceans, he said, you know what? We know that 100-year storms are going to occur every 10 years now. What does that do to our humanitarian assistance and disaster relief missions? Don't have to be a rocket scientist. That's a huge commitment for the Navy and the Marines and others too, Air Force possibly also. So they're looking at this and they're leading the federal bureaucracy because the rest of the bureaucracy is playing ostrich, to use Amory's felicitous phrase. And that's what it, that, you, you can say, well, that's the way it should be. They're the richest element of the bureaucracy and they've got the most interest. Well, that's not the way it should be. And yet that's what's happening right now. And I'm not criticizing that. I'm just using it, using it as an example of how things are adrift in Washington. Now, as we pursued this issue last week of Iran, another thing immediately became visible to me in terms of how I'm trying to figure this out. Our foreign policy right now, when we had as eloquent a speaker as George Washington, who said, essentially don't get entangled in alliances that are going to be detrimental to your interests. Our foreign policy right now in that region of the world that I and the Chinese call Western Asia, which tells you something about the Chinese interest in it, that Middle East does not, our foreign policy is basically sanctions on Iran and do anything for Israel that Israel needs done. I once turned to an undersecretary of defense for policy and said, there are no two nations that have ever existed in human history whose national security interests or interests in general are congruent 100% of the time. And his response was, there are now. 
That's pure nonsense. That is pure nonsense. And yet, coming back to the point made by the banking staff member, our foreign policy with respect to the Gulf and respect to, with respect to Iran in particular is being, the space for maneuver within it is being closed down and it's being closed down essentially by the herd mentality surrounding that issue with regard to Israel. Now, another interesting point that came up in the discussions was, well, you know, how, why is Israel, came out this way as I recall, why, why is Israel so tenacious about the West Bank? And I took that opportunity to enlighten this gentleman because apparently he was not aware of it, as to how much, the way, and here we come back to Amory's points and some of the points I'm sure are gonna come up later. Um, the West Bank provides roughly 73% of Israel's water. 10% for the settlers, so that's 83%. And about 17% for the Palestinians. Uh, is it about aggrandizement? Is it about territorial expansion? Is it about security? Yeah, it's about all those things probably a little bit, but it's really about water. Water. Royal Dutch Shell will tell you, it's when its strategists break down and go public, and, and they did go public with one aspect of this, that the future is either blueprint or scramble. Blueprint is when all these leaders get together, whether it's in the G20 or the, wherever it might be, and they essentially take what Amory gave you, what Clyde gave you, and what others are going to give you, and what you've learned yourself from reading and going on the internet and other things, and, and, and try to make a future, a strategy. The way we did in World War II, when our strategy was be the arsenal of democracy, and we hooked our economic power up to that strategy and produce so much, we buried everybody. The Soviets won because of our material production. The British and the French used our production. I mean, we were so huge in that respect that in 1945, we were making 54,000 airplanes in a single year and 7,000 ships. That's how big we were. Then we had a Strategy really formalized by Dwight Eisenhower, started by Harry, formalized by Dwight Eisenhower in the solarium, famous solarium agreement, 1953, called containment. And we pretty much stuck to that. We, haven't had, we have not had a grand strategy since the end of the Cold War. My former boss, I'm going to quit here. I'm running out of time. My former boss said to me one day, he said, Larry, we're a democracy. We're a democracy. We're like a rubber raft. We got a sail and it's askew. We got a rudder that's broken. We got holes and patches on the holes. There's water in the raft and your feet are wet, but it never sinks. It never sinks. That's not a bad metaphor for democracy. And yet, what I'm telling you is, for example, there's a SEAL Team 6 boat that is sleek, fast, got the latest technology going past us and headed out to kill some people and they're not necessarily bin Laden. That's no denigration of the seals. That's just a metaphor for where we are. We are a war state, a perpetual war state. There is no better exemplar of that in a physical sense than the last budget we dealt with in the State Department and that Bob Gates and Hillary Clinton actually have tried to do something about and Leon Panetta has continued that effort, but not much has changed. And that was when we had a $32 billion budget for diplomacy and the Defense Department had a $600 billion budget for war. Donald Rumsfeld once said, colon, with a, with a smile, I lose more money every year than you have. He was right. He was absolutely right. That's the dichotomy. That's the, the antithesis, if you will. Diplomacy on the one hand, so little. War, on the other hand, so much. And by the way, there was one mistake. I think it ain't $700 billion. It's $1.2 trillion. You got to throw it all together. You got to look at it holistically. It's energy and the nuclear programs. It's homeland security. It's now a over $100 billion intelligence budget. It's veterans affairs and it's DOD. When you put it all together, it's 1.2 trillion. We've done a study at IPS, you can get it, it's online. It'll show you that 1.2 trillion. And finally, my comment is that every soldier, 
sailor, marine, coast guardsman, knows we need to cut the defense budget and knows that the best way to do it is smartly and not stupidly and hopes that its civilian masters do just that. But we, I say we collectively, speaking of the military, the professional military, understand that we have to give back to the country and we're waiting for somebody to break this complex and break this war fighting mentality and do just that. Thank you.